And I am Dakota Clemens. Uh, I'm the builder of this contraption here. Alrighty, I'm gonna get into my slideshow here. Uh, so attractive effort, does anybody know what attractive effort is? Or think they know? Okay. So attractive effort is uh, a function of the amount of frictional force and torque that you can deliver to the rail in order to pull your train along the tracks. It's a combination of the torque of your locomotive power, whether it's steam, diesel, gas, or electric, and the friction coefficient between your wheels and the rail. And what that means is how good your wheels grip against the rail to pull you along. When a train starts moving, it's gonna need its maximum tractive effort in order to get the train moving. Once you've started moving, it doesn't require as much to keep you moving. The same as once you start pushing something along, it's a lot easier to keep it going than it is to start pushing something, especially if it's heavy. Couple key, feet, key things to know. One horsepower is approximately equal to 750 electrical watts. That's used for calculating uh, tractive effort, some of the tractive effort calculations. There are two types of tractive effort. You have starting tractive effort, which is gonna be like a static frictional force when you're stopped and you're trying to start moving. Your maximum tractive effort is going to be right when the wheels break loose or right before. Once the wheels break loose, you're actually probably going to see a good reduction in the amount of force that you're able to push against it because you've broken the friction. And then you have continuous tractive effort, which is a different calculation based on your speed and the, again, the friction coefficient between the wheels. So the, the one that we're gonna be measuring with this device here is gonna be your starting tractive effort, and that's gonna be when you're stopped, how much you can apply to start moving the load. And that is calculated using this formula, where the little mu symbol represents the adhesion coefficient, which is usually around 0.25 to 0.33. And that's just a simplified number to get you the amount of uh, grip that the wheels have to the rail. With aluminum uh, rail and steel wheels, we tend to go towards the lower end, the 0.25. And with the steel on steel in nice, flat, dry conditions, you're talking higher end, closer to that 0.33 value. So this is a little bit more complicated calculation. It really relies on the fact that you're moving and what you have is your 375, which is a conversion factor for pounds from what the actual equation would use newtons, and then horsepower and your speed in miles per hour. And this is just gonna tell you what the maximum uh, tractive effort is going to be based off of the horsepower of your locomotive at a particular speed. And that's useful for knowing uh, how much stopping power you can have at a particular speed, uh, as well as how much pulling power you have while moving. Now it's important to know that your tractive effort is going to be limited by two things, the adhesion to the rail and your torque or your horsepower. And it's going to be whatever is less. So if you have way too much horsepower and you can just spin your wheels like crazy, then your tractive effort is gonna be limited by how much weight you have on the wheels and how much friction there is there. But if you've got a lot of weight on your wheels and you don't have a very powerful motor, then your tractive effort is really gonna be limited by your horsepower. Um, this is an example calculation for a real locomotive, kind of a light locomotive, but if you had an adhesion weight of 280,000 pounds, and that would be the weight on the axles that have motors or have drivers running to them to push the train along. So if you have that weight distributed amongst multiple axles and only some of them are powered, you have to figure out what the weight is on the powered axles and only the powered axles. Then I have a coefficient out of adhesion, 0.33. We're gonna assume steel wheels on steel track, flat, dry land, good to go. We run that calculation. We have our weight on the drivers times our coefficient of friction and we have a pulling force of 92,400 pounds. It's a lot of weight, I wish my train could pull that much. We'll bring that down to eighth inch scale to make it a little bit more simple for you. So let's say we have a 900 pound diesel locomotive and regardless of how many wheels we have, because the more wheels you have, the more surface area you have, but your weight is distributed, it's kind of a balance. So it doesn't matter how many wheels you have as long as your weight is evenly distributed on all of, on all of them. 
so a 900 pound locomotive, let's just assume that we're on aluminum rail this time. We're gonna go with that 0.25. So we're just gonna take one quarter of 900 pounds and that's where we get 225 pounds of pulling force. Obviously these numbers are going to be approximate because everything is dependent on moisture on the rail, dirt on the rail, condition of your wheels, and all those other factors. So this uh, example, this is going to talk about our moving tractive effort, our continuous tractive effort. So this is where we're talking about having multiple axles. So to find your adhes adhesive weight, we need to figure out the total weight on the powered axles. My example I use here is actually one of my trains that I used to have. Um, if we've got a total of six axles and only four of them are powered, then we need to figure out the weight on our powered axles. We can assume that it's pretty balanced. So I'm gonna take uh, six divided by four gives me uh, two thirds. So two thirds of the weight of my train, if I have a 900 pound train, is 600 pounds on my driven axles. So if I take that value, the 600 pounds, and divide it by our coefficient of adhesion, which I'm using 2.5 or 0.25 in my equation here, then we get 150 pounds of pulling force. And that's gonna be where the wheels start to slip and slide on the rails and you can't go any, any more than that. Now, if we do the same equation with our continuous tractive effort, in my calculation here, I'm using an example of one horsepower at four miles per hour. We're gonna do our 375 times one, which is 375, divide that by four, and we get 93.75. So at four miles per hour with a one horsepower locomotive, I'm actually limited by my torque because my adhesive force is 150 pounds, but my torque is only 93 pounds available to the wheels, then my train is gonna stall out at that point and I'm gonna no, go no faster than that. If we had a more horsepower to that, we would actually slip the wheels at speed. So some key factors that are affect your tractive effort is gonna be your weight on the drivers. That's probably the number one thing that affects your tractive effort. The rail and wheel conditions. Obviously we've seen guys during the parade of trains, if you've been here before, sliding down the hill over here when you're watching them go across the crossing. <laughs> when we get oily, rusty, dirty, wet rails, it does lower your coefficient of friction and that's when you start to slide and that's gonna affect your stopping ability as well as your pulling ability. Sanding systems, I have seen in our scale. There are a few people that have built some sanders and all you're doing there is putting sand on the top of the rails and increasing your coefficient of friction by adding that grit in there to help your wheels grab the rail and move you along. If you don't have traction control and like in our scale, an example of that would be if you series your motors then the one that starts to slip is the one that's gonna get all the power and then you're gonna lose it. Just like if you're familiar with the differential in a vehicle, if you pick up one wheel on the back end of a pickup truck, usually that wheel spins really fast and the other wheel goes nowhere because your differential moves the power from the stuck wheel to the wheel that's spinning. And that would happen if you had seriesed motors in an electric locomotive. Now, as far as traction control goes, I don't know. There may be some guys that are real hardcore into the trains that have, I've never seen it, I've never seen it either, um, but it would be a cool concept. In the real locomotives, they're actually able to detect wheel slip and take the power from that axle and move it over to the other axles that don't have wheel slip in order to maintain speed and let that other wheel grab the rails again. And we're gonna get a little more complicated here. Um, talking about that continuous tractive effort, where we really focus on torque in that case because you're limited by your horsepower. And gear reductions, especially in electric, electric locomotives, that's probably the number one place I see gear reductions. Um, that's going to change your torque value. Like on your bicycle, you've got your gears that you go through and you have two turns of a wheel and it turns a gear that turns another one, one turn for every two, then we're a half ratio and we're actually doubling our torque and splitting our speed in half. Especially in electric locomotives, uh, that's kind of one of my special areas that I focus on. Uh, electric motors actually like to be run above 80% throttle or 80% pulse width or efficiency basically. Um, because they're getting 
they're, they're not heating up and cooling down as much. You're not getting as much uh, magnetic problems in the motor without going into too much detail. I can go into it real quick, a little detail. Basically, your motor controllers, modern motor controllers run by turning the motors on full blast and off really, really fast, like 40 kilohertz. And the time it takes for that switch to turn on and bring the vol voltage all the way up to 24 volts, it's generating a lot of heat, a lot of wasted energy in that rise time and fall time in that switch. So if you imagine the voltage going up and down and up and down and up and down, the more it has to change between up and down, the hotter it's going to get. So if you're running at a higher speed, it's going to be going, changing between up and down less, and then it's going to generate less, less heat. So to go into the torque uh, one more time real quick, my example here that I have is if the gear ratio is four to one, meaning that the speed of the wheels is reduced or divided by a factor of four, the torque value will be multiplied by a factor of four. So if you have a four to one gear ratio, you're gonna multiply your torque by four. If you have a nine to one ratio, you're gonna multiply your torque by nine. And on the flip side to that, if you had a one to four ratio, you're gonna divide your torque by four and your speed is gonna go way up, which is not ideal in our hobby. So a little more technical here, we're gonna add that gear ratio into our calculation for our uh, continuous tractive effort. I know it looks a little complicated, but it's pretty simple. So right, right here, this equation is showing us that our tractive effort is equal to the motor power in horsepower times our gear ratio times the 375 conversion factor we talked about earlier, and divide all that by the speed in miles per hour. And we'll go into an example for that. Didn't think you were gonna be doing math today, did you? <laughs> so horsepower, if you're familiar with electrical, horsepower is kind of like wattage. Speed plus torque equals horsepower, or multiplied, I should say. Um, so your horsepower, a one horsepower motor will never really change from one horsepower, but for the purpose of the calculation, we're gonna multiply our horsepower by the gear ratio in order to uh, account for that extra torque. So in our example here, I'm just using a, uh, what is it, a 16 horsepower motor with a gear ratio of six to one, traveling at five miles an hour. And you can see at the end, you have 7,200 pounds of torque essentially to your, to your axles. Now that doesn't mean to your wheels because we don't know the wheel size and that's a whole separate calculation. Um, but obviously 7,200 pounds sounds really great, doesn't it? It sounds like you could pull everything out here and have no troubles whatsoever. But it all comes down to how much can your wheels grip the rail? So this was a good example for probably a typical gas hydraulic engine about how much torque you can actually generate out the wheels. But again, without the weight, this is kind of useless. And to figure out what you would need in order to, what you would need to weigh in order to use all this, you can just multiply it by um, whatever your percentage would be. So if we're using a 0.25 um, as your friction coefficient, you know that's a quarter. So you can multiply this number by four and that's how much weight you need on the drivers in order to utilize all of that torque. It's actually very good information to have when designing a locomotive to know that do I have enough power or do I not have enough power? And am I overpowering my train and just kind of wasting battery power, wasting uh, money, you know, adding. The ratio is huge. Yeah, it is absolutely huge. Um, does anybody have any questions or anything? So this device is basically just a load cell attached to a stop and a coupler so that you can put your train up against it, couple to it and pull or push against it in order to read a number. So I do ask that you also do not slam against it. Try to pull up gently up against it and then push. No rocking back and forth or trying to see how much you can push against it because I can't guarantee it's not going to break the cell, the coupler or the stand. Oh, I did what I said not to do.